Hello again, my students. This particular lecture will be focusing on the end of chapter 12, uh, which is based on gene regulation. And the aim of the lecture is how do prokaryotes and eukaryotes regulate gene expression? Um, now, as usual, this particular lecture comes with three pages of lecture note sheets. Much of it are diagrams and a few leading questions to help you take your notes. If you are able to print it out, that would be great. It would make things a little bit easier for you. But if you cannot, please know that uh, you are always welcome to take it on a separate sheet of paper and then upload the notes for me so that you could be properly credited. Now, this particular lecture note sheet has some of these guiding questions. And I have on purpose given you a slightly different diagram which I'll be detailing in the lecture with, just so that you can have a different view um, depending on what kind of images may pop up uh, when you take these standardized exams, um, whenever they become available. Um, here's the continuation on page two of it. Um, oh, actually, there's only two pages of lecture notes instead of three. Uh, but you may also notice is that um, towards the end of this, there is an exit challenge, part five. Um, all of the detailed instructions I will be explaining later on in this lecture, but please note that you will not be able to add or create your diagrams at the end of this page because there really is no more space. So I would be expecting you to be using a separate sheet of paper where you will draw your own diagram to complete the exit challenge. So let's begin. So how are genes regulated in both prokaryotes and eukaryotes? What we're really talking about here is how does the cell control the expression of the many different chromosomes at different time periods during the growth and deve developmental processes. Now, um, this particular exit challenge that I have designed for you at the end of this lecture um, will bring you back to page 227 inside your textbook. Uh, within there, there is a text box that talks about how this mechanism works based on specific genes and how that actually can lead to genetic diseases um, once you understand how the basic mechanisms work when it is functioning properly. So there are two different ways in which we will be looking at this. We'll be looking at organisms where the genetic material, it's not bounded inside the nucleus of a cell, as in the case of prokaryotic cells. Um, it is from these organisms that we really get to see um, how on a Simpler, on a simpler level, how the mechanisms operate. So let's begin by looking at uh, the basic structures of what we call a gene. Now, um, a gene that is used for creating either a protein molecule of some sort or an enzyme actually comes with many different parts. Uh, it begins with a regulatory gene that you see designated right here. And then it is followed by a sequence known as the promoter, followed by the operator, and then the genetic information on how either an enzyme or protein molecule should be built, it's, if it's located further downstream in an area where the structural genes are going to, where the, basically the blueprint of the material uh, that needs to be built are going to be prescribed right down here. So in a prokaryotic cell, this involves a um, linear sequences of DNA. Uh, together, we call this entire structure that you see right here called the operon. Now, there are basic components to the operon. There is a regulatory gene that is upstream from the actual structural genes where the genetic information is um, encoded in. There is a promoter sequence indicated by the yellow region right here. There is an operator gene that sequence right up here. And then, of course, the structural genes. Now, these particular sections of DNA that is known as an operon can either be inducible, where the presence of a substrate would turn it on, or it would be repressible, where the operation of genes would be turned off um, by the presence of a product. Let's take a look at what I mean by that. But these are the basic structures. No matter if you're looking at an inducible um, operon or repressible operon, which is why this is shown to you first. So let's take for a moment and think about all of the food that we eat on a daily basis, right? A lot of the food that you and I consume, it could be regular milk, <laughs> it could be a fun having a night, a night, a fun of night, a fun night out with your with your family members on the eggnog. It could be um, ingesting yogurt, could be uh, 
some form of uh, uh, sweet rice pudding, could be beer or could be wheat powder uh, that you can find in a lot of the uh, pastries that we consume. So all of these foods have one thing in common, and that is they are high in lactose. Um, if you recall, lactose ending with OSE refers to the consumption of sugar molecules, right? But all of these things that contain sugar are not monosaccharides. They have to be further broken down in order for our body cells to absorb them and make good use of them uh, in the cellular respiration process. So you're gonna need an enzyme. And many of you are familiar with this. And of course, the name of the enzyme is called lactase that you have learned about in your fall semester classes. But your body cell has to be able to make lactase in order for you to break down lactose. And as many of you know, um, and you may have personally experienced this, is that not every one of us can produce sufficient amounts of lactase, which is the enzyme that you need to break this substance down. And if you cannot produce enough lactase, and say you go ahead and consume any one of these products that you see here, you will wound up with diarrhea because your body cannot break it down. So the thing is, your body really does not know what you'll be consuming at any given time throughout the three meals a day that you would be going about. So would it, is it supposed to be making a large amount of the enzyme lactase and awaiting for lactose to come in? What if you decide to change your diet altogether um, and you would go lactose free for a while? Or what if at this point in time you cannot find um, enough milk in your neighborhood stores for you to be consuming your favorite lactose, in which case all of the enzymes that your body would be making um, and on standby mode would be a total waste of energy. So your body has a way in which you can manage this, as, as in this case, um, the prokaryote um, that produces the enzyme lactase um, has a mechanism to handle and deal with that as well. This is what we call the lacoperon, and this is the basic structure. As you can see, it contains the regulatory gene indicated right here, all right? And then there is the promoter region where the RNAs polymerase would be binding on. Now, if you recall from the early portions of chapter 12, we know that this is where the enzyme RNA binds onto because it has to read what the DNA is coding for and how you're supposed to make it in um, the ribosomes and the ER after the message has been copied in the form of messenger RNA, right? If that's what you're aiming to do. So there is a region here right before the structural genes where there is an operator, all right, where the repressor protein would bind. Now, this lacoperon, actually, um, it's very interesting. Um, you would only make this particular enzyme called lactase when you do need it. So you don't want to be making a ton of these enzymes when you're not eating any food that would contain um, lactose in it. So by default, you, what you will find is that there are protein molecules that are binding onto the operator region. I mean, again, this is what it looks like. This is a structural makeup. So the binding occurs right here. So when you have a protein molecule that's binding right onto this particular operon area, this operator region, all right, you're essentially blocking off the RNA polymerase from running its course, from trying to get access to gene one, two, and three, or whatever number of genes there are, in copying the DNA. And if you cannot copy the DNA and you cannot create the messenger RNA, obviously the rest of the cells cannot do this job where it can produce the enzyme lactase. So this is what happens in the presence in the absence of lactose. So here is a hint that you can see. This particular protein molecule has a particular structure. It has an active site where something can bind onto it. If you're thinking about lactose, you are correct. In the presence of lactose, when it becomes available, it will bind onto this protein such that it will change the shape of the repressor protein that originally was binding itself onto the operator. So what happens when you bind onto it? It will no longer be able to bind onto the operon, onto the operator, so that the RNA polymerase, which is represented by this rectangular structure that you see here, will be able to travel down this DNA sequence such that it can copy the genetic information in here and therefore send the messenger RNA to the rest of the cell to 
create the enzymes necessary to break down the lactose that are inside the cell at the present time. Now, why and how is this related to the image that I'm showing you up here with a nursing infant? The reason why it's related because E. coli is found in the intestinal areas of a young infant as well. Now, when the baby begins to feed on either breast milk or man-made formula, there is a presence of lactose. With the presence of lactose, the E. coli that are embedded in the intestinal area will become activated because the milk protein would contain lactose, which then binds onto the repressible protein that is shown here, such that the RNA can bind onto and carry on the copying and transcriptional process of making the enzyme that is necessary to break down the milk that is now entering the baby's body. So when the baby is not feeding, or when there is a low level of presence of lactose, then the enzyme would no longer be necessary because you don't have any lactose for it to be working on. So there is no need for transcribing these structural genes that is shown here in the lacobron. Well, that's for making enzymes. Well, what about other products that are not enzyme based, but instead these are protein molecules. So let's take a look at a, um, a different scenario. Uh, and by the way, this is the image that I have shown you, which is slightly different from the other one that I've given. But what I like about this particular image is that it actually is much more compact, which fits nicely onto your lecture note sheet. So feel free um, to use this to answer some of the other questions, but essentially they are the same thing. Let's move on to the triple bron. All right. The triple bron has, again, a regulatory gene, uh, gene upstream, followed by a promoter region and an operator region. All right. And then the structural genes that are used uh, for coding the production of an amino acid called tryptophan um, will then be positioned right here. Now, how does your gene know when it needs to make more of the tryptophan and when should it stop? So this is an interesting scenario where it does the opposite of what you see earlier. So you notice how you have a repressor protein right here. It is in an inactive state by default, which means this operon is always on. The cell that harbors this, this prokaryotic cell, will be continuously producing these genes that are necessary to synthesize the molecule tryptophan. So then tryptophan is continuously being manufactured inside the cell. But then what happens then is that when you have a significant concentration of tryptophan, then the tryptophan will bind onto the inactive repressor such that it will change the shape of tryptophan until it changes into a shape that can be activated and then it will bind itself onto the operator as you see right here. Once it binds onto the operator that you see right here, the RNA polymerase will no longer be able to pass the operator such that the transcription tra process of this RNA polymerase will have to come to a stop. And therefore, no more translation would occur inside the cell. And therefore, the concentration of tryptophan will no longer continue to rise, which means the cell will not be making any more tryptophan until the cell consumes or uses a majority of this tryptophan molecule. And then when it does happen to be like that, uh, when you have a lower level tryptophan, then you will have no more binding of this molecule onto the repressor, onto the inactive, onto the um, repressor protein. Therefore, it will unlatch itself from this area such that the RNA polymerase can proceed again. So now, here's a quick summary of what have just been stated. You have learned that there are two types of operon. There is one type that is inducible, the other that is repressible. And essentially, what this, the, way, the, the way in which this works is that one of them is involved in a catabolic pathway. Now, as you recall in the fall semester, catabolic pathway is a chemical reaction process where you're trying to break down a substance. So this happens, you're producing enzymes that are necessary for breaking down substrates that are in the presence, like in the case of the lacoperon. But there, when you need, but breaking down 
molecules is just one of the many metabolic pathways and mechanisms that our body needs to stay alive. The other one is called anabolic pathway. All right, and that's represented by the trip operon that I have just presented to you. In that case, you're trying to produce a protein molecule that your body needs continuously until your body cells recognize that, oh, we have enough of it, all right? So what has been shown to you is how it actually occurs in the prokaryotic cell. Now let's take a look at what happens in eukaryotic cells. So it turns out the eukaryotic cells are far more sophisticated uh, on many different ways, for instance, there are a lot more chromosomes, genetic material that is involved in the nucleus of a cell. The genetic material is also encased separately from the rest of the cell, because remember, prokaryotic cells do not have a nucleus, whereas eukaryotic cells do. So there are five different ways, as is indicated in this diagram with the numbers that are designated on it, that um, in which the eukaryotic cell can control at many different levels, which genes gets expressed when, and which one gets manipulated or modified along the way, such that you can leave it on the standby mode, or you can just simply break it down when you don't need it anymore or when you have too much of it. So let's begin with the first step. You can moderate this process in the first level known as transcription. That is when the messenger RNA is being created by copying the DNA. Now, the transcription process can also be used, as you learned earlier, for generating rRNA, ribosomal RNA, and transfer RNA. You also need this transcription process. A second level that you can control this is by having uh, different mRNAs being produced from a single gene. So you can copy different sections of it. Another way you can control this is you can control the stability and rate of translation of particular messenger RNA, which means you would only be manufacturing particular amino acids or protein molecules or enzymes and hormones at different speed, at a different levels of frequency based on the physiological changes inside your body. You can also regulate it by changing the protein activity, how active this protein is going to be. Do you leave this at a standby mode or do you make it an active protein right away? All right, and then you can also choose to further regulate it by controlling how long you would allow this final product that your cells have created inside the cell. How long do you leave it there? Or do you break it down quickly? Or do you leave it, or do you have a mechanism to prolong um, its mechanism such that it would be functional for longer periods of time? So it is much more complicated. Now, it actually gets even more interesting than just these five different mechanisms that the cells have to regulate gene expression. There is also something that modern science, in particular in the field of genetics, have uncovered called epigenetic controls. These are mechanisms in which genes can use to alter the gene transcription and translation process, all right? Meaning you can use it to control how much of the DNA gets expressed and which portion of gene gets expressed. So how does that actually work? Now, Epigenetics is defined as the study of how cells and organisms change gene expression and function, but without changing the genetic sequence of the DNA.